Our Digital Humanities Coffee and Happy Hours have always been a feminist and anti-racist space, which means that this applies to our virtual hour events as well. Harassment and discrimination are not tolerated here, but most importantly, our Digital Humanities community at ASU operates from a place of care and compassion. We support one another's work, safety, and livelihood, and that support is ever more important this year as we all struggle with new and old challenges. Most importantly, though, what that means is that the digital humanities community at ASU shapes the digital humanities programming for the year. So if you have a project, a topic, or a reading that you'd like our group to discuss, please let me know. And I know that some of you are interested in just having a happy hour, so I'm happy to make that happen before the end of the year. Just tell me. So now it is a pleasure and an honor to introduce Dr. Corrales, who will be presenting Ephemeral Bodies, a Media Archaeology of Queer Zines. Spencer D.C. Corellis is the founder and executive director of Digital Frontiers, a conference and community that brings together the makers and users of digital resources for humanities research, teaching, and learning. Dr. Corellis' research in history of the book appeared in Book History, a special issue of American periodicals on children's periodicals, and in Buzzademia, scholarship in the internet vernacular, a special issue of Hyperhis, New Media cultures. In June of 2019, Dr. Corrales joined the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign as assistant professor and digital humanities librarian. They hold a PhD in English and American literature from New York University. And as a brief note, I've had the pleasure of calling Spencer a colleague and a collaborator for a think eight years, maybe more. Um, we've had the opportunity to work on everything from digital humanities community building to linked open data together. They have been a mentor. They have been a colleague um, and a friend for almost my entire professional career in academia. Their work has always been an inspiration. I'm so honored that you were able to join us to make time to talk about your current research. Today, Spencer, I feel grateful. I feel lucky today, as I do every day, that I get to hear from you. So, Dr. Corrales, I will hand the mic over to you. Liz, thank you so much for that really generous introduction. Um, I'm really grateful to be here today to share this work. Um, I have been exploring this for a while and it's beginning to shape up and to a, a little bit more final stage than other times I've talked about this. And uh, I'm really excited to get your, um, your feedback today and to hear um, some of your ideas and responses to the work. There is a, um, Liz, if you could put the link into the chat um, for the references document, there is, uh, uh, I prepared a references document that has links to articles and um, and my bibliography, as well as links to both of the songs that are mentioned in the talk, um, including the, the, the song you heard as you came into the room today. I do want to point out uh, that there is some strong language and nudity represented here um, in both comics and photographic form, which are drawn from primary sources. And I've endeavored to include them here in a way that is respectful both of the primary sources and of my audience. This work is drawn from my recent research on the visual culture of the early years of the AIDS epidemic, exploring how the HIV bo positive body is reproduced and represented in ephem ephemera and popular culture. During a summer residency at the Queer Zine Archive Project, I started teasing out some questions related to the way texts and images in digital archives on the internet and in print media interact and interrelate. As I examined ephemeral texts and images in archives and online, I began thinking about the layers of remediation involved in the production, distribution, and digital, re digital reproduction of ephemeral materials like zines, flyers, and pamphlets. And I've been thinking a lot about community, the much contested notion of the LGBTQIA plus community, communities of makers, communities of readers, and communities of praxis in digital scholarship and digital libraries. This work then is at least in part about finding and forging community through the visual and textual languages of queer zines. In American popular culture, representations of the HIV positive body have largely been defined by Therese Frere's iconic 1990 photograph 
of gay activist David Kirby on his deathbed in an Ohio hospital, which was appropriated as a United Colors of Benetton ad. Against that image and other representations which medicalized or stigmatized um, HIV positive people, people living with AIDS and their allies worked to remediate the HIV positive body and ephemera, including safe sex pamphlets, zines, comics, and propaganda. In this, I project, I consider the reclamation of the erotic body in zines and comics and how the HIV positive body is reimagined as an object of desire. I also consider how the rise of the desktop computer and desktop publishing software influenced DIY culture and self-publishing, um, which is the, to a degree the focus of my talk today. As part of this media archaeology, I also examined the preservation and digitization of zines and other ephemera as a form of remediation that requires a specific ethical positioning in relation to these materials and the communities that produce them, engaging with the social texts that frame zine preservation, including the zine librarian's co code of conduct, folksonomies and other metadata schema, and zine collection and digitization policies for major research libraries. Uh, from a theoretical standpoint, I'm profoundly influenced by Jose Esteban Munoz's account of ephemera in Cruising Utopia, in which he extends the notion of the ephemeral far beyond the materialist bounds of the term typically used by book historians and media scholars. Munoz um, tells us to think of, a, to quote, think of ephemera as trace, the remains, the things that are left hanging in the air like a rumor. Ephemera are the remains that are often embedded in queer acts, in both stories we tell one another and communicative physical gestures, such as the cool look of the street crews, a lingering handshake between recent acquaintances, or the mannish strut of a particularly confident woman. In the zines I'll describe here today, the expression, the gesture, the pose, and the experience of ecstasy are restrained and retained in prose, image, and design, in the telltale smudge of a dot matrix printer, and the clean lines and crisp photo reproductions of desktop publishing software. These zines are traces of queer bodies and queer communities, and this project seeks to situate them within queer time and in resistance uh, to the harsh light of Frere's photograph and the tyranny of medicalized imaginings of queer bodies in the dominant discourse. So what then is media archeology span and what value does it bring to both my project and to zine studies in general? Juicy Parika sees in the field a prototype of the steampunk aesthetic. Um, they describe media archeology span as rejecting quote, universalizing models for technical, technological progress and interest in, in experimenting with alternatives in quirky ideas. Media archaeologists excavate novel paths that fall outside the mainstream and think about the new and old in parallel lines and actively defy disciplinary boundaries. For me, this feels like a safe middle ground uh, between the digital humanities on one hand and history of the book on the other, and provides me access to technologies, theories, and methodologies that are either marginalized or proscribed in those other fields despite claims on the part of DH um, of big tent inclusivity. And of course, book history has never been particularly big tent in its uh, approach to things. Uh, the other term that I wanted to sort of frame my discussion with here is DIY, shorthand for do it yourself. In this context, neither indie nor small press, terms that imply some degree of professionalization in publishing contexts, account for the means of production and circulation I'm concerned with in this project. Rather, I draw on the DIY aesthetic of punk, encapsulated for me in this um, item from Nicole Panter's Six Things You Can Do to Make the World a Better Place from her 1994 collection, Mr. Right On and Other Stories. Nicole was the manager for the germs, so she knows what she's talking about. Uh, zine makers indeed stole and likely continue to steal from their employers, from their schools and other places, um, making art from the fringes. Some 1990s zine makers pilfered paper, office supplies, and other resources from their jobs and used printers and copiers on the sly at work after hours. I even knew a guy who worked a graveyard shift at Kinko's in uptown Minneapolis who'd let friends use the machines behind the counter that weren't uh, metered to make their zines. 
So what exactly then are zines? Author and activist Stephen Duncombe suggests that the best way to answer that question is to hand over a stack of zines and let the person um, asking the question decide. The zines, zines are DIY publications that short circuit traditional modes of publication and distribution to enable makers to speak in their own voice to their own communities without the intervention and sometimes the censorship of editors and publishers. Zines continue to be a vital media for queer and trans folk to share their work. There's also, of course, a much older history of self-made publications. In Coming Out Under Fire, Alan Barubay describes a newsletter that circulated in the queer underground of World War II that was printed on office mimeograph machines and circulated through the mail. And likewise, the fanzine tradition dates back decades. What I'm doing here, though, focuses on the milieu of the early 1990s. While the quality and production value of zines may vary, vary widely, frequently when we think about zines, we imagine something rather like this 1995 zine by Houston zine maker Eric Deutsch. In June of 1995, after scrimping and saving and maxing out his credit cards, Eric Deutsch went to Paris. Eric knew that AIDS-related secondary infections were killing him. His T cell count had fallen and the available medications were merely taking the edge off of opportunistic infections, including candida albicans in his mouth and throat and molluscum contagiosum on his face and thighs. And he had suffered terrifying suffocating bouts of pneumocystis pneumonia. When Eric returned to Houston, he documented his experiences in a zine titled AIDS Kills Fags Dead. The title is a rebuke to singer Skid Rose Sebastian, um, to Skid Row singers, Sebastian Bach's no notoriously homophobic t-shirt and Guns N' Roses singer Axl Rose's cheerful admission in an interview that he would shout abuse at gay men while driving through Los Angeles. This zine and two issues of Eric's 1993 zine, Homo Boy, are preserved in the Queer Zine Archive Project and can be downloaded as PDFs. The zine collects grainy photos, copy of French, copies of French safe sex pamphlets, and Eric's writing about the trip and his experience of his illness. Much of the text is in barely legible nine point fonts printed, it seems on a dot matrix printer or a cheap inkjet. It's impossible to tell in the Xerox, um, uh, the, the, those printouts were cut and pasted into the zine and then copied multiple times. The images here show the cover of the zine with a cartoon punk with a mohawk um, an inner page from the zine showing Café La Comète and Hotel Rivoli, and a snapshot of Eric from a Dali exhibit at the Louvre. Just over a year after his return from Paris, Eric died of complications from AIDS on September 29th, 1996. He was 30 years old. One object of pilgrimage for Eric was Jean-Hippolyte Flandrin's 1836 painting, Jeune, Jeune homme nu assis au bord de la mer, um, which Eric calls the boy on the rock. Um, the image here is of the text from page six, rotated 90 degrees for comparative legibility, though it still renders in a way that's difficult to read, as it is in the original half-letter format. Eric writes, after one solid year of misery, poverty, loneliness, near-death, government bullshit, pills, pain, frustration, failure, nothing is going wrong. I mean, goddamn, I'm sitting on the floor of Sully in the Louvre, listening to the Smiths, boy with a thorn in his side, staring mesmerized by the boy on a rock by Hippolyte, Hippolyte Fran, Flandrin. I snuck out of the hotel room when Lisa fell asleep to come back here as it's open till 10 and I'm trying to find my way back. And I'm listening to Zymox, the first with a day, which was the music you heard as you came into the room today and sit beneath him. I wait for him to pick up his head from his knees and look at me, extending his hand, asking me to join him on the rock above the tranquil bay, of, a tranquility of the bay below us. Eric's ecstatic response to the painting and his impulse to view it repeatedly and to prolong his viewing evokes for me T.J. Clark's insistence in the sight of death that, quote, astonishing things happen if get one gives oneself over to the process of seeing again and again. Clark's 2006 
uh, meditation on Nicholas Poussin's Landscape with a Man Killed by a Snake and Landscape with a Calm, which were juxtaposed in a gallery in the Getty Museum during a period in 2001 when Clark held a six month residency there. The Side of Death joins interventions by John Berger, W.J.T. Mitchell, and of course, Walter Benjamin in picture theory, theory that engages with images and the act of looking and for Mitchell at least, the places where the verbal and the visual intersect. While Clark cautions against reading the site of death as a manifesto, it does provide a rarefied model for a mode of seeing that is what's critical, but also deeply personal. Reflecting that his notes would be interesting, quote, primarily as a record of looking, taking place and changing through time, Clark insists that the sort of looking he performs is both demanded and rewarded by some pictures. Eric Deutsch was no scholar, but in his two brief visits with the boy on the rock, he seems to experience the dissociative effects that Clark describes resulting from repeated viewing, when in Clark's terms, quote, depiction breaks up, recrystallizes, fragments again, and persists like an afterimage. As Eric prepares to leave the closing museum, his fantasy of connection becomes exquisitely vivid. I move closer and I swear in my lightheaded state, I see him raise his head a second very quickly. He looks me in the eyes, then it's over, but the image is burned, his image is burned in my head. The next time I'm suffocating from PCP, it will be this I see when I go unconscious. His, um, avocation, his evocation of the suffocation of pneumocystis pneumonia, which was treated with a nebulizer that produced a sensation of drowning, conjures the specter of his own death. Thwarted by the downturned gaze of the boy on the rock, Eric is left only with a burning after image and postcard and poster reproductions. Eric expresses a fierce possessiveness of these roofed, reproduced images of his boy. I've been in love with him for so long. He's been raked by the use of his image on postcards, t-shirts, and posters. I have him in sizes three by five and 24 by, 20 by 48 but now I am meeting him in person life size. I've been in love with art before. No, not like this. In the intervening years, digital reproduction has facilitated the dissemination of images at an unimaginable scale. Both the scholar Walter Benjamin and the punk zine maker Eric Deutsch saw violence in the reproduction of art, but in digital culture that ship has sailed on so many levels. And while digital reproduction is not preservation, it does facilitate access and discoverability in unprecedented ways and thus facilitates repeated looking in ways neither Clark writing in his, in his diaries in the Getty in 2001, nor Eric Deutsch dying in Houston a few years earlier could have anticipated. It's interesting to me that two of the principal forms of images that inspire repeat looking in the digital environment, pornography and memes, also have precedence in the ephemera of the early years of the AIDS epidemic. ACT UP and Queer Nation and zines like Diseased Pariah News produced striking graphic images that circulated on stickers, zines, posters, and flyers as analog memes engaging in a propaganda war to name names and raise awareness of what was at stake in the AIDS epidemic. These images were in contentious and sometimes violent dialogue with the AIDS kills fags dead and God hates fags memes of the homophobic religious right and with a death obsessed culture that persisted even among allies. People living with AIDS resisted images of the dying body like Frere's photo I referenced earlier as a brash and body counterpoint to the medicalized representations of people with AIDS. Disease pariah news was an entirely slicker proposition than Eric Deutsch's zine. Published in San Francisco from 1990 to 1999 by Tom Shearer and Beowulf Thorne, uh, DPN sought to, quote, bring some much needed levity to the experience of HIV infection and also to reclaim the HIV positive body as an object of desire. Notoriously, the duo documented Shearer's death from AIDS complications um, in the second issue. Among DPN's regular features were sexy centerfolds, meme-like slogans, recipes to help readers, quote, get fat, don't die, and porn reviews that rated, that rated videos on how well they integrated condom use. Beowulf Thorne, born Jack Henry Foster, was a graphic designer and pro, um, who produced the layout and illustrations for the zine. Thorne used then cutting edge desktop publishing software like Quark Express and early Adobe products to design DPN. 
Uh, desktop publishing emerged in the late 80s in parallel with the proliferation of the personal computer. While I resist some of the euphoric declarations that desktop publishing revolutionized um, publication design and production, I do recognize that the emergence of desktop publishing and the personal computer and peripherals like scanners and printers facilitated something of a boom in Z production zine production, a sort of zine golden age in the early 90s. This boom was fueled in part by two software packages that came on the market in the late 90s, Quark Express and Adobe Photoshop. Uh, Quark Express was a desktop publishing software that was first released in 1987 for Macintosh and um, was created um, by Tim Gill, who is now a uh, recognized LGBT rights activist and philanthropist, and Mark Pope. Um, uh, Quark provided one of the earliest WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get environments to produce complex page layouts and that enabled, um, and it also was one of the first softwares to use polygons for text wrapping around complex images. Um, you could also curve text along a line, which was tremendously innovative at the time. The software also supported kerning and ligature, ligatures between text boxes um, and allowed the use of TrueType for Apple and PostScript Adobe fonts. Um, in the 1990s, uh, Quark Express held roughly 95% um, of the desktop publishing market, even though it retailed for around $700. Adobe Photoshop, um, which came about, uh, was originally developed in 1987 and was sold to Adobe Systems in 1998, uh, was, a, was, is, was and remains a graph, raster graphics editor. About 200 copies of Photoshop were actually distributed with a slide scanner um, in its original release. Um, and again, Adobe was and remains fairly expensive, um, retailing for $895 in 1995. What this meant was that if um, people who weren't employed in, in the graphic design wanted to use this software, they probably had to steal it. Um, I actually copied uh, my um, copy of Quark from the half a dozen um, floppy disks um, from the University of Wyoming's um, uh, publishing department, newspaper, um, the newspaper and, um, and uh, literary magazine publishers. So uh, that was how I got my copy of Quark that I used to make zines in the, in the 90s. Um, since Beowulf Thorne was a professional designer, it's possible that he didn't need to steal his copies of Quark and Adobe from his boss. Um, but Thorne did use Adobe Photoshop to create the serial comic Captain Condom which appeared in um, Disease Pariah News and in his the Gawk newsletter, Gay Artists and Writers Collective. Um, Thorn, uh, uh, Captain Condom follows the adventures of Clay Carpenter, an HIV positive man who finds himself transformed into a safer sex superhero. My cat's about to pounce on me. So if she Zoom bombs us, um, I apologize. Uh, the Captain first appeared in 1988 as part of the student run condom co-op project at UC Santa Cruz and continued in Thorne's zine Gawk. A two-page version of Captain Condom continued in Gawk while the longer serial was printed for DPN readers. Captain Condom draws equally on both classic superhero comics and queer graphic erotica like Tom of Finland for its aesthetic. Through the comic narrative, Thorne examines tensions around safer sex that had emerged in the gay community by the early 90s. Safer sex activists were derided by some as sex Nazis, who were trying to undo the perceived gains of gay liberation post Stonewall. AIDS also exposed rifts of internalized homophobia within the community in which the same narratives of uncleanness and immorality that anti-gay activists on the right deployed are used against safer sex advocates. Crew-cutted white boy Ben of Peer Club typifies this attitude with his safe people not safe sex mantra and his derision of, of for clones hairdressers, drag queens, and what he calls leather freaks. Safer sex in the comic is shown in the context of erotic intimacy between Clay and his friend and sometime lover, John, who has just gotten out of the hospital. Condom use is naturalized and eroticized in their encounter, which includes Clay putting a condom on John with his mouth and anal sex. DPN never shies away from the harsh realities of living with AIDS, and Captain Condom is no exception. The comic depicts the realities of early 90s drug cocktails and the undercurrent of violence and hostility toward people living with AIDS. The comic emphasizes, though, the intimacy and mutual support of friends and lovers in the face of these ob obstacles, and indeed in the face of death. 
In addition to the comics, DPN regularly featured centerfolds of men with HIV who posed nude or semi-nude to reclaim sexuality and desirability for the AIDS body. In issue eight from 1993, centerfold Brian Covell, a 25-year-old San Francisco graphic designer, poised, posed for a spread titled Landscapes for the Imagination. Wearing only an imaginary VR helmet, Brian sits in a posture that coincidentally echoes the pose of Flandrin's Boy on the Rock. The centerfold spreads included information about the models, including their profession, interests, and their T-cell counts, their favorite medications and procedures. Photoshop enabled slick photographic reproduction and sophisticated layouts. Thorne's design aesthetic is on full of display in these spreads. But more importantly, the DPN centerfolds humanize these men living with AIDS and celebrate them as sexual beings worthy of desire and worthy of preservation. Despite his technological reproducibility, Brian Covell would be dead within a year of his photo shoot, and his centerfold becomes the trace, the remains, the thing that is left. The zine retrospectively becomes a memorial for a beautiful body, and the young man who inhabited it, wist playful and wistful, and enduring long beyond the ephemeral flesh long since left behind. Thorne continued to publish the zine until his death in 1999. Nine. He was memorialized by his collaborators in the final issue of DPN with an irreverent piece titled, Dang, Our Founder and Guiding Light Died. No doubt he would have approved. Thorne's centerfolds and comics were powerful interventions in reclaiming representations of the AIDS body from the collective obsessions with blame and stigma that typified the early years of the epidemic. So what then are the implications of this work for digital scholarship and what does digital scholarship have to offer this work? These are complex questions that are not merely methodological, but technological. Much digital scholarship in the humanities has focused on digital texts, since text is fairly easily reducible to data for algorithmic analysis. Digital images are another story, although there are some advances in machine learning for image analysis, this, remain, this work remains either in its infancy or under the auspices of the surveillance state in the form of facial and pattern recognition software. For my purposes, I'm more interested in the process of remediation necessary to do digital scholarship and to build and use digital repositories. Digital texts are derived from digital images mediated by optical character rec recognition software that reinscribes texts for analysis and reproduction. Digital objects, including images, are enhanced with textual metadata that facilitates discoverability and access, but metadata is not neutral. There are tensions between the metadata applied by professional catalogers and the folksonomies of the communities which reproduce the artifacts being cataloged. The metadata applied by catalogers, while intended to make an, an object discoverable, may well render the object invisible to the community that produced it. It's well documented that unconscious biases affect the way catalogers, archivists, and collection development librarians interact with materials related to marginalized communities. There are some efforts to address this, like modernizing the way um, gender and sexuality are expressed in Library of Congress descriptors and in Zine Core X, a Dublin Core-derived metadata standard developed by the Zine Librarian's Interest Group to bridge between the industrialized standards of library science and the folksonomies of those who make and treasure zines. But metadata inevitably colors the way we act, interact with digital images, often in ways that are invisible to users, and bad or even outdated metadata renders objects invisible. I also, in, in, my, in further work, want to examine more closely how zines are preserved and made available to readers and researchers. Um, as part of this effort, I recently built a metadata for the template for Tropy, um, a uh, tool to help researchers organize images from archival research that's based on the Zine Union Catalog and the Zine Core X metasta metadata standard. And you can find a link for that in the resources document. I'm also curious about the potential of software emulation to expand the register of media archaeology. Could exploring the, in, uh, the original software help me find traces of software and print technology like dot matrix printers in works that have been multiply Xeroxed? Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, I know it's possible to find like sort of Mac 2E 
the emulators, um, the challenge might actually be finding um, copies of Quark Express 3 that are still viable. This work is in some ways melancholic, and as such, for me, it moves slowly. Uh, I came of age during the early years of the AIDS epidemic and am still haunted by loss and survivor's guilt um, and other um, traumas that were inscribed on my sexual coming of age um, because of the, the, the global AIDS pandemic and the way the AIDS, pan, the AIDS epidemic in, in the United States in particular uh, was represented in media um, and in faith communities and other places. Uh, but through these images and my interactions with them, both as material objects and in their digital reproductions on my computer and in online archives, I'm beginning to imagine a media archeology span that can, can account for networked images and all that entails. A theory of media that in Kathy Acker's terms, quote, supposes a community. Digital humanists working with visual, materi visual materials and print media from marginalized communities must recognize what I'm beginning to think of as the protocol stack that makes these images possible. The infrastructure ranging from acid-free boxes to cloud servers and all of the underlying texts, including and especially metadata, both official and folk, that facilitate description, discovery, and access. And of the communities, past, present, and future, who, um, who our work serves, communities of kind and communities of praxis, but always communities of people who contribute to the complex language of word and image that makes our shared digital culture possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Spencer. And I wonder if y'all would join me in either using your emojis or um, maybe just clapping with me. I'll snap a little bit. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Um, I just wanted to jump in really quick and say that was emotional, that was informational, um, and it was a reminder for me and I think maybe everyone watching that our media pasts are really important to our personal and professional histories and, and futures. So that was amazing. Thank you. Um, and so I just wanted to remind everyone, you know, we're going to do Q&A by if you if you have uh, anything that you'd like to uh, type into chat as a question for Dr. Corrales, please do so. Um, if you'd like to raise your hand to ask a question, um, I think we we have a uh, we, we can maybe unmute some people for those questions. But as people get together, their questions are type into chat, I think. What I usually start with um, for question and answer for these events is something along the lines of, you know, why DH? How did you get into DH? But I think that might not be um, the right question to ask. It might be something like, how does this project maybe subvert the traditional definition of digital humanities? Or how do you see it as, yeah. um, you know, outside the big tent, but maybe transforming the big tent? Um, and, and what do you see the big tent as now? Because I think that definition was maybe from 2011, so where hopefully it's been buried. Yeah, you know, um, at Digital Frontiers a few years ago, Rupika Rassam's keynote address was called Burn Down the Big Tent, um, that the whole idea of big of tents is still implies gatekeeping and still implies, um, uh, you know, some sort of mediation of who gets to be in the, the space, right? Um, and I know that there are still institutional and, um, you know, funding agency reasons for wanting to define what counts as digital humanities and what what was meaningful in terms of methodology and stuff. And and I and I frankly like don't give a shit about that stuff. Like, I, which I guess is kind of like my job. But um, I I don't have any real like moral investment in what gets to be called digital humanities. Um, because I think the goal ultimately, and this has been sort of bandied about in the DH commercial, the DH circle commercials, um, DH circles for years is the idea that at some point it's just going to be humanities again, right? The, the whole point is to naturalize these methodologies in the humanities discourse so that it just becomes what we do um, or part of what we do. Because I don't think we'll ever, um, uh, you know, obviate the need to read text or to look at images. You know, if you have machines that do it for you, um, that is, I think, in some ways, a really profoundly anti-humanist way of approaching these materials. Um, and while I think that there's some value in um, 
being able to take a high level look at a large corpus, um, you always have to bring it round, back around as I did in this talk to the people. Um, and it's both the people that are producing the works that you're, that you're making um, and also the people who are doing the work of preservation, um, doing the work of um, digitization and, um, and doing the work of, of telling these, keeping these stories told uh, that we have to come back around to. So um, I think my, my humanism is more important um, to me than um, my um, technocrat status, right? So, um, and I think that the, the, if the work doesn't center on humans, then it's not humanistic. It's not humanism, period. So. Um, JJ's question, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Palin, for joining us. Thank you. Um, Thank you, guys. And I'll, I'll just read it if that's okay. Um, yeah. Spencer. So uh, JJ asks, how does your having lived through the zine renaissance of the 90s affect your work? Put another way, does your work in this area vary from how others see this work who did not live through the time period? And thank you again for that question, JJ. Um, I think it has to. It has to affect the work because it's, you know, I, I've made zines. I still make zines. Um, like, uh, I um, am still st sort of steeped in this culture, just like I'm still steeped in the, the music of the 80s, you know. So I... Um, I really just think that it's the, that I, there's a perspective that um, you can't avoid if you didn't if you weren't there, um, uh, and that you can't reproduce if you weren't there. At the same time, that also makes it hard, as you probably saw in this talk, for me to get like intellectual distance on it because I, you know, like I didn't live in Houston, but I knew people who um, were who blew um, their 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 savings and. Uh, maxed out their credit cards to go to Rome or to go to um, to uh, to London or Paris um, because they knew they were going to be dead soon. Um, you know, I um, got turned away from a friend's funeral by his family because they didn't want um, the rest of the family to know that he was queer. So you know, it's there's it, it is deeply personal in a way that like my 19th century book history stuff um, absolutely is not. Um, so. Uh, and that has to, and I think that we need better ways in scholarship of accounting for that personal valence in scholarship. You know, um, you see it, especially I think in queer theory now, um, the, the Jose Esteban Munoz, um, uh, may he rest in power, um, and uh, Lauren Berlant and others bring, uh, uh, Jack Halberstam brings this kind of um, personal valence to their work. Uh, there's also, um, uh, you know, uh, models, there's actually models, um, Susan Howe's work in um, early, early American literature, um, her book, My Emily Dickinson, um, is a really powerful sort of document of um, her personal interaction with the poet and her legacy. So um, there are models of this, but I think we need to be more um, encouraging of it and, and actually teach that kind of personal reflection as a method. Um, rather than trying to eschew it in favor of um, of uh, some sort of like faux clinical nonsense that is not constructive. Yeah, and I, I'll just read this comment from Sarah Benson and then maybe get your um, your feedback on it. But my sister said it shouldn't be called research, but rather me search. Um, she thinks that's true. I think that's true too. I think maybe we're we're getting we're getting into a conversation now about maybe humanities can evolve into or can re back involve into or I'm not sure if we're going back to an imagined past there but but something that um that that gets back to the communities right in which it it, it the humanities should be birthed from if that makes sense well I mean there's there's already an area of, of humanities research that is exploring these things there are actually so I think there may be two areas one is affect theory um like Cyan, um, Cyan Nye and Lauren Berlant to a degree, um, uh, uh, that um, where we think about the way things make people feel, um, the way aesthetic objects make people feel, and also trauma studies where we think about um, the effect of, um, of trauma on uh, art and aesthetics and also on communities. Um, and yes, JJ, autoethnography is definitely a part of that. 
um, and is a methodology that's used in um, both of those those communities. Um, I think the one of the things, one of the challenges, especially in sort of core humanities like um, English, which I was trained in, um, and history, is that we are well. Even if you're thinking about affect theory, you don't. We're, you're supposed to distance yourself, your own affect, from what you're doing. So. Um, and uh, I got lucky and had some um, some mentors um, like Brian Waterman, um, who famously like brought himself to tears in one of his talks about um, uh, uh, um, some 19th century uh, um, victims of seduction. Um, and uh, Pat Crane, who is really generous in the way she thinks about um, children's literature. So you know I've had good mentors and models for this, and um, and also you know. Uh, work like Munoz's work that is so profoundly um, emotional. So uh, I think that there's a lot of space for this. And I think that there's a lot of room for pushing methodological boundaries um, and like, and, but also bringing some of those methodologies like autoethnography into the digital space. Thank you so much. And then just a reminder, please do type in chats or comments, anything into the chat and or raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. And it looks like we have uh, something from Sarah Benson. In law, many feminist scholars used personal narrative to illustrate their own struggles with discrimination. It was, no surprise, criticized for failing to be neutral as a researcher. Um, and I, I, I think if you have any comments, Spencer. You know, um... Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's famous essay, Mapping the Margins, in which she uh, more fully articulates the concept of intersectionality, is a really fantastic of that example of that, Sarah, from um, law. Um, and uh, where she and and in that she also uses literature as evidence um, in her in her legal and structural argument, which I think is really incredible. Um, I've taught that essay um, several times, and students are always blown away by how compellingly she used literary evidence to um, support her, her legal and structural arguments. So um, I think that's a, a, a really Im important observation. And, and it also is an indication that we as humanists should be less afraid to, you know, for all of our talk about interdisciplinarity, um, there's a lot of gatekeeping around where we draw our evidence from. And so, um, well, like Crenshaw has gotten um, a lot of uh, mileage now in critical race studies. It took years um, for that cr crossover to happen and for ideas of intersectionality to really penetrate into um, humanistic scholarship. Thank you so much, Spencer. And uh, yeah, Sarah, just as a, there are still many, many naysayers, unfortunately. Um, and I think that that is true. Um, and I, I just wanted to, there's a question here from Monica, Monica Boyd. I had a recent conversation about the AIDS epidemic and memorialization and how we aren't doing that with COVID. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the zines negotiated reclaiming the desired queer body with grief. Yeah, um, I, there are other zines that are more explicit about grief. I think um, Disease Pariah News in particular didn't talk a lot about grief because it was about using black humor as a coping mechanism, you know, this real gallows humor. Um, so I think that that was, and you see a lot of that, especially in the punk, the more punk zines, um, where it's just like this big fuck you to the whole idea that um, grief is um, even necessary, that the, that the transition from loss to rage was what needed to happen. You know, David Wonorovich's um, desire to uh, claim to like that when I die, throw my body on the steps of the CDC. You know, it was this idea that um, that memorialization had to be a political act, and and that rage was the more appropriate response. Like we'll grieve when we finally have time, um, and so uh, the which is not to say that there wasn't grief. Obviously, there was, and and still continues to be. Um, those of us who lived through it have a huge sense of loss um, from that. Um, and especially folks um, is maybe who are a little bit older than me who lived through it and are still HIV negative, um, who are just sort of stunned um, and, uh, uh, you know, sort of gobsmacked by the fact that they're alive um, and so many of their friends are not, um, that they're alive and well and so many of their friends are not. You know, that whole generation was gutted. 
Um, in terms of how we're thinking about uh, memorialization in relation to COVID, I feel like that our accelerated media culture doesn't give us a lot of space for grieving. Um, I also think that the numbers are so staggering that we, it's really hard to grapple with it. Um, and unless you know someone personally uh, who has been affected by it, it, it the, the scope of it is so, um, so difficult to wrangle. Um, then uh, I also, but I have seen uh, efforts online for communities to engage with it. If you use, look at the hashtag um, quarantine on Instagram and Twitter, and you'll find a lot of zine makers who are both using zine making to like fill the time, right? To give, to do something to make your hands busy so that you don't feel so um, freaking alone under these circumstances. Um, and um, you know, and people, I, you know, I've had friends send me zines in the mail and and stuff. I got this really, it's right here somewhere. Um, I got this really delightful little one of um, some witches that is that I'm really charmed by. Um, Liz, was that you that sent that to me? I, 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 okay, I thought so. Um, so because it just came like without any um, note or anything. So, uh, but um, and also people are writing zines about their. Um, their experience. So, you know, related to, I think, the, the graphic medicine um, movement in comics and comic studies, where we're using comics to both teach and to learn about um, uh, the experience of illness, um, zines have a place in that discourse as well. Thank you so much, Spencer. I, I want to note, I, one of the notes that I took, I've just been like adding to it as you've talked, like zine making is about pilfering, resistance, intervention, censorship, and now documenting experience, right? And we have a question yeah. here from Sarah. Can you talk more about zines and their understanding of audience? And perhaps this same question might come up in dig digitization or collecting efforts. Yeah, so zines are, I mean, in their sort of physical form, uh, tend to be small, have a small circulation, right? So you could make print off five copies of your, your zine and um, drop it off on the table in the front room of your neighborhood coffee shop, leave them there. And you know that the circulation is gonna be about five people and whoever maybe they share them with, you know, or um, you know, if somebody reads the zine and then puts it back on the table, that could increase the circulation. So it's something much more akin to what we think of in book history as a coterie circulation, a, a small, um, uh, the, the, you know, sort of maybe closed circle of uh, of uh, shared readers, uh, but that was actually not the you know in some cases the zine circulation was much larger. So you had publications like Facts Fact Sheet Five, um, which was a zine review zine. Um, so it was a zine of zine reviews, and in with the reviews they would include the address and contact information for the zine maker. Um, and everybody would send their zines to fact sheet five um, so that they would get reviewed there and your contact information would be there. And then, so you'd get in the mail um, a copy of somebody else's zine with a stamped envelope so that you could send your zine to them too. Um, so this kind of exploded into a more networked um, model of circulation that wasn't quite as coterie, but ended up still having some of the same aspects of coterie because it was people with shared interests, people with shared values, who were wanting to participate in the same community and conversation. So it's a, it still has aspects of that, though it's much more distributed. Um, not as distributed as what you would see in an online circulation, um, but similar. Although I, you know, we now use the, like people use the zine hashtag if they tweet um, a link to where you can download their zine and print it out. Um, I've done that with my little copyright zine. Um, and I know it gets taught at different institutions around or used in classes at different institutions around the country. So um, it's, you know, so uh, it's, it's the, there was a sort of prototype to this sort of network circulation um, that was, but it was done through the mail and done through, you know, I, I'm still shocked at how much cash I sent through the mails um, in the 80s and 90s, but you just put like $2 in an envelope and wrap it up with a letter or put it inside your zine um, and mail it off to somebody to, to buy a copy of their zine. So that's a, it was a, a it was a, a moment that, and on sort of on that cusp between the rise of 
the personal computer and desktop publishing, and then the emergence of the public internet, um, when the post was still really super important um, and facilitated a lot of these conversations. Um, the, what that does though, in terms of digitization and collection is it does make it so that there's a lot of challenges, ethical challenges um, that we have to consider um, before we digitize something. So um, like the zines that I showed um, have both been digitized uh, and are available online. Uh, the makers are dead. Um, they left, there's no estate that you could query. And so um, both New York Public Library and the Queerzine Archive Project decided that it was appropriate to digitize them and share them. Uh, and uh, the Qs app tends to digitize things proactively and then um, and they have a, a takedown policy where if somebody wants to not have their zine uh, posted, it's they, they can have it, they'll take it down. Um, but they tend to, to default to um, digitization. Other projects like the Austin Fanzine project, which my friend Jennifer Hecker leads, um, she it was her zine. Uh, uh, that, so you know she has the IP, but it was coming out of the '90s punk scene in Austin. And a lot of these folks like grew up to be like accountants and lawyers and in state government and shit. So they um, ended up. So she would be like a little cautious about publishing publishing them, and so she would reach out to folks and ask if it was okay. And some of them were like, "Oh no." Nobody needs to know about that time I barfed at um, the that bar on um, uh, 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 Guadalupe Street. You know, it's it's the it's the so um, so there's some tension in that. And she was working on crowdsourcing transcription of the zine because it was all handwritten and OCR just really would choke on it. So, um, but it uh, ended up sort of putting the project on pause because there was some resistance from the folks that um, that were represented in it. Uh, Likewise, um, you know, there's some artists who maybe don't want their sort of um, juvenilia circulated online. Um, the Duke in their zine collection has made the policy that they're just not digitizing anything. Like you have to go to Duke to look at their stuff. So um, other places like Bernard uh, and or Barnard and um, University of Chicago and a lot of the independent um, uh, archives like QZAP. Um, are more liberal about it. And thank you for that, Spencer, because I think it also poses the question that we might not have time for today, and maybe we can all go away thinking about is, who does own all of the documents that we digitized? What communities own them? And what is the, you know, what, how important remediation is for all of the work that we do, the digital work that we do. So thank you. I wonder if, you know, we only have about one minute left, but I wonder, Spencer, if you'd talk a little bit about what the next step for this project is. Can we, can we all get involved in emulating an old system and getting a copy of Quark Express or, or what do you think? So yeah, I am. I'm actually in talks right now with some folks in our digital preservation department about um, what it would take to get up, um, to get uh, a, a Mac 2e emulator up and running, and thinking about um, and seeing if we can find a copy of Quark Express. I, and, and honestly, I don't know what that would necessarily teach me, but I, w I won't know until I do it, right? So um, it's sort of like uh, it's um, something experimental and. And you don't know the results of an experiment until you do it. So um, I'm curious. That's one thing I'm going to try to work on. Um, I do, and I also want to get deeper into the archives. Um, I need to look at, I, like right now, as you can tell, this the my archive is very white. Um, there are a lot of um, communities of color, especially um, trans sex workers of color who produced zines um, to help educate each other about safe sex and safety. Um, and I want to look at those materials and see how they do this work differently from the white boys that had access to desktop publishing software, you know. Um, and I also want to look at um, how uh, the fetish communities used um, zines and other types of uh, materials to educate on safety and, um, and to remediate um, the HIV positive body within those communities as well. Thank you. Hopefully we can have you back uh, for phase two, a talk on phase two of this work. Um, thank you so much, Spencer, for sharing time with us today. Um, everyone's in chat just thanking you for being here. I see a couple of people clapping, um, so I'll clap for everyone. Thank you. 
Um, and I just want to remind everyone briefly before we we go, and I'm going to stop recording in a minute so that if anyone wants to stick around and say hello, um, you can do that. But our last digital virtual hour, digital humanities virtual hour at ASU of the semester will be December 1st at 11 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. JT Roan from ASU will be presenting on Dark Agora's Insurgent Black Social Life and the Politics of Place. And I will put that link in the chat. I want to just take time to say thank you again, Spencer. That taught me a lot about um, how possible it is to um, have a personal digital humanities and, uh, and uh, important digital humanities. So thank you.